Hello, everybody, and welcome into another episode of the Fantasy Pros Football Podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Warmly, and joining me today is Debro. Debro, how are you doing? We're just a couple weeks away now here from the start of the season, mid-August. Everything is really starting to get going here. I mean, it's it's a good time to be alive, dude. Uh, best ball season. It's preseason DFS time. I mean, look, I, all the things and the stuff and the Discord has been popping over the last few days. You can tell that fantasy football is waking up, baby. So I'm loving it. You're also loving that we are joined today by one of your friends in the industry, Ian Harditz, Love that, lead fantasy football analyst at PFF, host of the PFF Fantasy Football Podcast. Ian, thank you so much for coming on today's show. Great day to be great. Appreciate you guys having me. And yeah, last time I saw Derek, we were uh, drinking beers deep into the night <laughs> and uh, from the friendly Three, confines of Mount Texas. <laughs> hey, Sounds man. Like- you, uh, I was about to say, you get to some of these fantasy football conferences, and that's how it goes. It's always uh, always fun out there. But yeah, guys, excited to talk uh, talk some all things uh, sleepers. So let's, let's get after it. Yeah, sounds like a good time. We'll try and have a good time on today's show as well. As always, I want to make sure the listeners can find the three of us online. Ian's Twitter handle is at iHeartIt's. Debro <laughs> is at Debro underscore FFB. And I can be found at Ryan Warmly. And of course, we can be found everywhere online at Fantasy Pros. I also want to mention an awesome prize Fantasy Pros is giving away to the listeners right now. We've got a free signed Devontae Adams jersey giveaway over at fantasypros.com slash contest right now. All our listeners have to do to subscribe to our YouTube channel is go to youtube.com slash fantasy pros, then take a screenshot, submit it at fantasypros.com slash contest before the end of the month, and you'll have a chance to win. I also want to let everybody know about a great tool Fantasy Pros offers this time of year, the Cheat Sheet Creator. It's a great tool that allows you to combine all your favorite experts into one consensus cheat sheet. With our expert sync feature, your cheat sheet will automatically update whenever your chosen experts update their rankings. You can also further customize your cheat sheet with tiers and player notes. Plus, you can use your cheat sheet in both the draft simulator and the draft assistant tools on both our website and our draft wizard app. So make sure you check out our cheat sheet creator at fantasypros.com slash draft wizard. And since only premium subscribers can get the most out of that cheat sheet creator, if you're not currently a subscriber, then we're offering you an amazing deal that gets you premium for six months without paying us a dime. You can check out that deal at fantasypros.com slash offers. Guys, I think I said the phrase cheat sheet plenty of times during that. (laughs) So we'll just jump into it now. You guys are going to be sharing your all sleeper teams on this episode, which will be made up of guys going past pick 100. Hundred in our consensus half PPR ADP data that can be found at fantasypros.com slash rankings. Debro, I will start with your quarterback on your all sleeper team. I mean, look, uh, I, I'm going to have to flex on the people. I put out one gym tweet. Ian shows up here in a tank top. I might be able to not be able to flex as well as he can, but I am going to flex on people and have them understand that Tua Tagovailoa is going to break out this year. Going at QB 16, 120th overall. The hate is ridiculous. I do not understand it. Haven't understand it. Still don't understand it. For a quarterback that finished top 12 and legitimately clean deep pocket or deep ball accuracy. I'll get this out eventually. Deep ball accuracy rating, clean pocket completion percentage, under pressure accuracy, and everybody knocks the man because, well, he was incredibly accurate throwing the deep ball last year, but he didn't do it very often. Why is Tua going to hang in the pocket behind a terrible offensive line last year. Legitimately, this is an offensive line that was credited for the fourth highest pressure rate. So you're telling me Tua should have been sitting back there and try, just taking hits and with the laundry list of terrible wide receivers they had last year outside of Jalen Waddle? No, 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 no. They have now Tyreek Hill, Jalen Waddle going into his second year. We have the offensive line is upgraded this year and I think Tua is going to crush in fantasy. So the, one of the problems with picking a QB sleeper is the fact that the top, depending on how you want to look at it, 11 to 13-ish guys are all pretty entrenched as very high ceiling. A lot, Most of them have done it before. So what's the case for Tua breaking into that tier, not just being a value at QB 16, but of actually joining into one of those upper echelon groups? I think Tua's mobility is a little bit underrated and as well as you don't add a player and pay him like they did in Tyreek Hill to not utilize the man. So we have not seen Mike McDaniel actually run an, run an offense. Like, yes, he's had a hand in it in San Francisco and we're, we're putting a lot of things on this Dolphins offense and saying, well, it's probably going to be slow paced. Well, they're probably going to be run heavy. 
We don't freaking know. We legitimately do not know what this offense is going to look at. And if we're just reading the tea leaves, guys, like you don't add Tyreek Hill if you want to run the ball a ton every single drive. So I think Tua can get there both if we see upside from the passing volume in this offense, much less if even if we just see efficiency. So a lot of passing game touchdowns. He has the weapons to do it and the offensive line to keep him clean. I think he could sneak into the top 12. I think that's absolutely in his range of outcomes. Ian, who's quarterbacking your all sleeper team? Guy right behind to a Justin Fields, QB 17, Love pick it. number 126 off the board. I just think Fields is a better fantasy football quarterback than anyone going after, you know, basically that car cousin Stafford kind of tier of pocket passers. You can throw Aaron Rodgers in there, sadly, at this uh, point in time. But with Fields, man, like, you know, not to shit on Derek's pick, but same amount of top 12 finishes already. They each have four in their career, even though Tua had the entire extra season. And I know he was coming off the hip injury to start, but I just don't think Tua is really built to be this fantasy friendly quarterback. He's never had a career game, even going back to Alabama with 50 rushing yards you look at the offense and yeah i think his efficiency is going to be great you know it always was for jimmy garoppolo in san francisco and not like we were really lining up to play jimmy garoppolo over the years either so we'll see with Tua. i just don't he might crack the top 12 but i don't see him having this sort of season where it's like my god like how did we not draft Tua down here fields is the one that if we could just get an average an average passing you know season which is asking a lot with these weapons let's let, let's face the facts here but an average passer man that's all we need here because of how much he could be running the football pff right now projects him for 140 rush attempts which just the guy the quarterbacks that we've seen historically have that many rush attempts even 125 or more they really don't bust we've had 12 quarterbacks get at least 125 carries over the past decade and 11 of them were top 12 fantasy quarterbacks per game i'm not just picking the Dudes that played 16 games out there, you know, the Ezekiel Elliott, Antonio Gibson, Colory, and the way you can hype up those guys. So the only one that didn't qualify was 2020 Cam. He was the QB 17. And to be fair, the Patriots weapons in 2019, 2020 do, you could argue they're better than what, you know, the Bears are going to be putting around Justin Fields. But last four full games of 2021, QB 3, QB 9, QB 8, QB 10. I think Justin Fields is this year's bad real-life quarterback that actually gives us a lot of good fantasy production because in these offenses, same thing, honestly, to lesser extents, but in Philly and San Francisco and Baltimore over the years, when you have these dual-threat quarterbacks, it's not always the exact type of offense that, you know, we're used to seeing. It's not the smoothest thing. It's not going to necessarily lead to a bunch of condensed volume across the formation. It is usually very good for that one quarterback. Ian, I've asked this of Debro on this show before, actually, so I'll very quickly ask you as well. Do you see Fields as a very high end two, or are you totally comfortable if he's your QB one? No, high end two. I don't want to draft him as my QB one. I've had a couple best ball drafts with it, but I will say, man, if you really want to go zero QB, I mean, Fields is, I think, Fields is the last guy that I think you could potentially rationalize with the QB one, but usually like I'm trying to get like a Cousins or a Stafford to, to pair with him at that point. Uh, typically though, guys, I know we're talking sleepers here, but round five, round six is when I'm trying to get my quarterback because I just think the disparity between Josh Allen going in like round three and then in my opinion, the end of that tier with Kyler and Jalen Hurts, I want those guys Guys, usually in round six if they fall that uh if they fall that far because the running back that's, that is the running back dead zone basically and then the wide receivers in that range there are some hits but you know we have really big wide receiver tiers this year i feel like so i'm more content to potentially get the quarterback or tight end at the right price if it means that the wide receiver is going to fall back to me isn't that big of a value drop off i, I love ian's point and i love his fields love here and just for clarity's sake i have fields almost touching that he's qb 13 for me right behind trey lance right now so good man i love all these points and he's my highest roster quarterback in best ball right now so i love everything ian's saying here i'm all in on fields man i think that he we saw him outside of a lot of these other rookie quarterbacks you actually saw justin fields take another step go go back watch the pittsburgh steelers game he almost wheeled that crappy team to victory in that game so i i love the fields pick here Debro, give me your running backs on your all sleeper team. Well, I, a lot of the rest of this list is rookies, second year players. And look, I want to invest and be above market on a lot of these players because we're seeing rookies, second year players break out at high rates. And one that has been constantly all over the social media timeline is Brian Robinson. We've talked about him on previous episodes, going to discuss him here again. RB 56 going at 156 overall 
I think that is going to climb, but I still think he'll probably settle somewhere outside the top 100 in that handcuff kind of tier. Antonio Gibson just can't stop putting the damn ball on the turf. It, 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 like, he just can't, he can't help himself. He's fumbled in preseason. Over the last two years, he's tied for the most fumbles amongst running backs with Ezekiel Elliott. Brian Robinson is a fantastic fit for this offense. Washington last year, tons of inside zone runs. They had, uh, and Brian Robinson excels at inside zone run scheme. 33% more st- missed tackle for a straight. Eventually, I'll get this out. Apparently, I'm having problems with words today. <laughs> and he had the fourth highest explosive run rate on inside zone runs. So you add that, Antonio Gibson, they don't have a lot of faith in him. They showed us that in the draft by drafting Brian Robinson. They took Antonio Gibson out after he put the ball on the turf in the preseason and parked him straight on the bench. Now we hear Antonio Gibson is working with the punt team. So, yeah, I want a lot of Brian Robinson because if he takes the early down roll away from Antonio Gibson, hell, I think there's a range of outcomes where if they didn't trust Antonio Gibson a ton in this offense, much less on passing downs, we could see Brian Robinson and he doesn't have to be flashy. He doesn't have to be. He could just be dependable and he might run more routes and make J.D. McKissick even less of a thing than Antonio Gibson ever could. So I think the upside is definitely there. Yeah, I wanted to ask specifically about the ceiling. Let's imagine for a second that Gibson really is basically out of the picture. I mean, I don't think they're going to like trade him or anything like that, but Robinson becomes clearly the number one guy. In that scenario, what do you think the ceiling is? Are you talking RB20 type season? Are you talking closer to RB1? What sort of range do you think he can wind up in? I think your median is looking at him as, uh, if he takes the role, as a mid to low end RB2. Now, in saying that, We saw Antonio Gibson perform as a top 15, top 16 running back in back-to-back seasons. This is when with terrible quarterback play. And I'm not saying that Carson Wentz is going to be good. But if Carson Wentz is any better than freaking Taylor Heineke was last year. He is. He is better. I don't disagree with you, Ian. You can hate Carson Carson Wentz. You can hate Baker Mayfield. But my God, can we just admit that they're better than Taylor Heineke and Jacoby Brissett? The bar is not that crazy, guys. No. I I, And I I agree with you. And that's what I'm going to say that, like, If his median is mid to low range RB2, the high end of this, if Carson Wentz, Carson Wentz doesn't have to be good. Just throw the damn deep ball good, limit the times you mess up during a game, and we could look at Brian Robinson touching RB1 territory if everything, all the stars align. Ian, let's move to your first running back on your all-sleeper team. I like the Robinson call at a minimum, you know, like if Gibson gets hurt, Robinson's the one shooting up the ranks. McKissick isn't really Mm going to be moving all that much standalone value questionable, but all the guys we're talking about at this point in the draft can't be that thrilled about the standalone value. I'm getting higher and higher in general, but also just on Naeem Hines, because you look at really all the things he has going for him now. And this is a guy where Frank Reich told us way earlier in the offseason draft him. And we kind of laughed about it. It was like the typical, you know, March or I think it was March uh, storyline that just ends up getting tweeted out there everyone going crazy about it but we are moving from once to matt ryan another objective upgrade and when you look closer at the way they play quarterback we can i think expect some more rb targets for naeem hines and jonathan taylor whoever happens to be back there hearing the reports about you know the lesser workload i'm not too worried about that uh for jonathan taylor but with naeem hines man again saying all the right things throughout the offseason it's all good news there but the big thing for me guys lost in kind is preseason week one I don't care about the performances really, but if we have any sort of indication that's going to help us, you know, see these depth charts more clearly than whatever the hell these interns are putting out, you know, day to day, that's what I really want to see. And Naeem Hines had a hundred percent of the snaps when Matt Ryan and the starters were in there in that first week of the preseason. I didn't think he had that in them in him because earlier in his career, man, like it was him splitting snaps with Marlon Mack. And even Mar- when Marlon Mack got hurt, they'd elevate Jordan Wilkins. And there's a reason why Naeem Hines never has over a hundred carries in a season yet this could change man like if he's legit going to be leaned on as the workhorse without Jonathan Taylor all of a sudden Hines like he's not JD McKissick he has a legit RB1 RB2 level ceiling should something happen to Jonathan Taylor even if this is a one data point sample size you know and we kind of see Philip Lindsay come in and take away some of those carries at a minimum I think Hines without Jonathan Taylor could be looking at 15 combined targets and carries per game which that's in a good offense like the Colts could be behind that offensive line we'll see if they can take a little step forward after a disappointing 2021 but 
I just think there's a lot of potential outs for Naeem Hines to meet value where he's going as the RB45, 127th player off the board. Because I just feel like, guys, and you, you look at kind of the RB3s, the Michael Carters, Kenneth Gamewells, Alexander Madison's, like you can wait another round and get guys like Daryl Henderson and Naeem Hines. And my next sleeper, who I'll get to in a second, that I really do think fit a similar archetype. You could argue Naeem Hines is just 11th round Tony Pollard. Oof. I, I, I don't dislike that call. I will say this, though, Ian. I got to ask you, man. Like, it, with your Heinz love, who's your 101? Is it JT or CMC? CMC in full PPR. I still give yep. JT the My nod man. Uh, with the carries. So, Yep. Uh, I'm with you. Uh, it, CMC has been the 101. Stays the 101. Will be the 101. He's just that dude, man. But anyway. We're not, we're not good enough at predicting injuries. That's what it comes down to. We just, we talk about it like but off Twitter the tells me they know, Ian. Twitter tells <laughs> me they know. They've got, they've got the, the crystal ball, man. They already know. And they, but they do need some new injury jokes. I will say that. Like, I, I, I agree that McCaffrey versus Jonathan Taylor is more quote unquote injury prone, but like, let's see an actual analysis on this because it's not like Taylor has a 0% chance of missing a single mm-hmm. game here. Like, I think it's a lot, I think it's a lot closer if people would actually take the time to think about it. It's a lot closer for all these guys. Well, M- McCaffrey just burned guys so deeply when you are the number one overall pick and yeah. then you get hurt for most <laughs> of the season. Like, it's just an emotional reaction. You, 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 you got burned. Uh, Debro, give me your next running back. Another guy who's nominally the backup right now. I mean, you got to live recency bias. And and I, I love this guy for a lot of different reasons. And and Ian mentioned him real quick. Kenneth Gainwell, uh, RB40, 124th overall. I mean, the word out of camp, he's going to be used heavily in the red zone. We see Miles Sanders is already banged up with a little something in camp. Kenneth Gainwell, I think, could soak up the money touches in this offense. And everybody's going to talk about, well, Jalen Hurts doesn't throw to the running backs. Jalen Hurts is a mobile quarterback. Those are all true. That doesn't mean that, like Ian's talking about, if anything happens to Miles Sanders or Kenneth Gainwell supplants Miles Sanders on early downs, he doesn't have to garner a ton of volume on the ground. He can get targets through the air. Because last year we saw in small samples, he was legitimately that good in the passing game. 14th in yards per route run, right behind Austin Eckler. 8th in PFF receiving grade amongst running backs with 20 or more targets. So, if you also want to add into the design of the Philadelphia Eagles offense. So, if they not only go back to, okay, they're going to pass more, all these different pace picks up. Their no huddle rate in weeks 1 through 7 was fantastic. They were top 10. So, if they go no huddle... If Kenneth Gainwell is the guy on the field, they're not huddling up. They're not mixing in and out players. We could be also underestimating his snap rates on a weekly basis based off of matchups. And if they do run more no huddle or that comes back this year. So I think from a lot of different perspectives, I love Kenneth Gainwell, both the passing game. We know he has that in his range of outcomes. And he was quietly productive on the ground. 35th in yards after contact right behind Eckler and CMC. So... All these names I'm bringing up, this is the kind of talent that Kenneth Gainwell has. And he's not being drafted as such. He's just going in that handcuff here. So enjoy the value, man. Ian, is, is Gainwell the running back to own in Philadelphia right now based on where he's going? I'm cool with him. I, I had an article go up uh, last week or a week ago where I just kind of went through all the rounds 10 and on, like my favorite kind of late round running back target in each round. I did have Kenneth Gainwell as the round 14 target. A lot of reasons that D-Bro just says, I mean, any sort of like rookie running back target kind of studies you pull up, you just see Kenneth Gainwell's popping on it. And also you see Michael Carter's name on there, which is another Mm -hmm. interesting guy. But now my my next sleeper running back is going to be the guy who I have going round 15 right after Kenneth Gainwell. That is Jamal Williams. We're still, we're not getting the hard knocks, you know, as big of a bump as I thought, guys, because he's just such an entertaining guy. I thought that maybe people would finally see just the vision here and they aren't so great. We can still get Jamal Williams, you know, just round later than guys that I, I think are arguably just worse projections ahead of him and definitely worse uh, values when you consider the cost and everything. So with Williams, yes, said DeAndre Swift show. It's going to be probably 60-40 like it was in week one of the preseason with the starters, but that's still room for Jamal Williams. And I really think like if we're trying to find this year's version of like a James Conner, it could be Jamal Williams, this proven three down veteran back who is going to be somewhat annoyingly touchdown dependent, you know, to as long as DeAndre Swift is healthy, but 
it's this Lions offense, and my God, it seems like it's everyone's, it's anyone's sleeper team out here. So if their offense is a little bit better, I think we can see Jamal flirt with a little more standalone value. And if something does happen to Swift, I just think Jamal is a good chance of taking over. I know it didn't happen last year, but that was also when Jamal was dealing with hip, thigh injuries. He had a stint with COVID later on in the season. And even despite all that, man, he had 20, 18, and 19 touches in those games. So yeah, we got Justin Jackson and Goblin and you know Jefferson. A couple guys are there, but we've seen Jamal Williams, one Aaron Jones missed time previously, handle a three down role. I just think where he's going, he's, he's basically the last like potential flex with benefits, if you will, that you can even get. I don't believe I have a single running back with more exposure in best ball land. He is going right now, though, in redraft land as the RB 52 pick 142 overall. He's going next to like Tyler Algier and Daryl Williams, who <laughs> come on, man. Like if either of those guys doesn't even make the team, we wouldn't be like that shocked. Yeah, he, he's com- I, yeah. completely free in drafts right now. And he I don't know that I've heard his name on at least any of the shows I've been on since like December. I mean, he's just not a guy hard knocks aside who has, has gotten any publicity whatsoever. You sort of address this, Ian, but just to follow up, like, is this offense going to be good enough to support two fantasy relevant running backs? Not many are, man. Like, really, I think like Cleveland and Green Bay are the only maybe Denver. Like, there's this the, the, the idea, the Let's whole idea Dallas. of, uh, yeah, yeah, hopefully, man, just. That's the thing about Pollard. Like, we know they're going to play Zeke ahead of him. Are they going to be playing, like, Jake Ferguson and Noah Brown ahead of Tony Pollard now, too? Like, I hope not. <laughs> oh, please we'll not. See. We'll see what happens there. That's going to be a hell of a day on Twitter uh, when that happens. So, <laughs> I, I think Jamal, like, you're not going to fire him up as, like, an RB2, but I think he can give you, like, you know, flex value, particularly once we start getting the buys going. So, generally, the standalone value thing, again, I think it can be a, uh, more of a myth uh, more times than not. But as – Relative to the other guys going this range, 100%, uh, you, you'd rather have him. Debra, let's move to our all-sleeper team wide receivers. Give me your first wide out. Well, first of all, I do have to mention, uh, yesterday on our live draft, uh, our mock with Graham Barfield, I, I took Jamal Williams. Love that pick. Good man. Uh, I said he was the Motor City Darrell Williams, so mm-hmm. love it. Love it. Um, it doesn't have to be sexy people to score you fantasy points, okay? Just so we throw this in here. Um, but I will mention, uh, moving over to a sexy pick, Jalen Tolbert. I, I keep talking about him. ECR hasn't caught up with it yet. Best ball ADPs are catching up with it. Put some damn respect on this man's name. Wide receiver 56, 143rd overall. Gallup, we have no clue when he's coming back. And I hate to break this, and I'm not trying to shade the man. But for the majority of Michael Gallup's career, he has been just a guy. You look at his rankings in yards per out run over his career. And stop me if, I, if I'm wrong here, Ian, Ryan. Um, if these just jump out to you mouthwatering and, and you want to draft some Michael Gallup. Uh, he was last year, 64th in yards per out run. The year before that, 69th. Breakout season, he was 10th. Okay, cool. Give you some credence there. And his rookie season, he was 59th. So three out of these four seasons, he's been eh, to ooh. It's not been good. And so you have Jalen Tolbert, who is airdropped into one of the best offenses in the NFL. They're going to be top 10 in passing rate. They're going to be top 10 in pace. Jalen Tolbert is that dude, and I get he wasn't an early declare. We also need to understand the context of some of these guys coming out of small schools. Like, if your agent and the people around you are saying, well, you know, you're not getting a lot of buzz. You're probably not going to go high in the NFL draft. Why in the absolute hell is Jalen Tolbert going to come out and say, I am so happy and excited to be a fifth round pick or a UDFA in the NFL draft. But now he waited a year. He put up better numbers. He's he kept balling out at South Alabama where, I mean, you look at this guy's stat sheet, seventh and sixth in receiving yards amongst all FBS receivers of the last two years, 32nd and 12th in yards per route run. He is that dude. And all the training camp vibes have been glowing, spectacular about Jalen Tolbert in camp. So why do we not want to put respect on this man's name? And why is he not getting drafted higher? He's getting drafted at the end of the 11th round. What round should he be getting drafted in? He should be going, I mean, for the target, he should be going around like the Christian Kirk territory, like in the wide receiver 40 to 48 range and stuff like that. And if not, I would love for somebody to tell me a good reason why not, because 
He's got the talent. He's airdropped in the offense. We've seen rookie wide receivers, which I won't even start and go down that rant. But everybody loves rookie wide receivers when we talk about last year and their production. But we get to draft season, everybody's like, ah, I don't know about this rookie. I don't know if he could do it. And we keep poking holes in it. And again, when we get done with this season, we're going to look back on it again and say, hmm, really wish I'd have drafted all these rookie wide receivers. They're good. So I, I don't get it. Ian, what round are you taking Tolbert in? And also, who's your first receiver? I think where I think where he's going is more okay. I'm a little bit con- – again, I, I just don't, based on what we've seen from the Dallas offense, which, hey, they're the reigning number one ranked scoring offense, so they got to be doing something right. But at the same time, uh, I, Noah Brown could just play ahead of Tolbert until Michael oh. Gallup comes back. And don't put we did see – I know, I know. And I – <laughs> Look, the Cowboys path, it's just, what are they waiting for? Why do they have the second most available cap space behind only the Browns, which is obviously the structure of Watson's contract is the only reason why they're one. I just, man, maybe I just can't quit Will Fuller, but I feel like the Cowboys aren't done adding to this. I knew you were going to bring his name up, man. Or someone, man, bring Beasley back. Like, just come on, man. Like, what, Vasher? Is that their wide receiver four at this point? Like, this is just insane. It's like, you have Dak, you're paying Dak Prescott to be your man. Like, help the guy out a little bit here. Like, what what are we doing? But, I mean, again, but there's a lot of there's a lot of ways for Tolbert to to fit it. He, he's a discount kind of version of Russell Gage, as is my first sleeper, Tyler Boyd, going off the board, wide receiver 48, pick 123. Actually, now right next to Russell Gage, how the times have uh, been changing compared to a month or two <laughs> ago. But with Boyd, someone I was really really high on last year, probably too high as we saw how it kind of worked out. But still, back to back seasons as the wide receiver six and PPR points per game. If you have Tyler Boyd in your flex, no, it's not the sexiest thing. But we have a full time receiver and an off offense led by Joe freaking Burrow. If there is going to be an offense in the league like the Buccaneers last year that can, you know, enable three fantasy relevant wide receivers, I think one led by Joe Burrow could be in that group. Burrow was leading the NFL in dropbacks as a rookie before he got hurt. And then we had Zach Taylor take his foot off the gas last year, but that very well could have been just kind of trying to get Burrow back comfortable from the injury and also got to keep in mind if something happens to either T. Higgins or Jamar Chase, I don't see the other Mike Thomas like stepping up and just completely taking a he- over ahead of Boyd. I see Boyd getting back to that potential like 2018, 150 targets, uh, just, you know, obviously on a per game extrapolated basis. So I think Boyd is someone being drafted at his floor. Again, wide receiver 48, he's been wide receiver 36 back-to-back seasons. And he has that upside with just one injury to either guy in the offense away from being a legit upside wide receiver too. So those are the players I really like taking around this uh, range. But yeah, Gage, Boyd, Tolbert, Gage is even less so now with Julio, and that just throws a wrench in all these things. But when you can get these starting wide receivers that are in an offense where they have room to rise, those are the situations I'm really looking to attack in these later rounds. Yeah, you know, you look at both of your guys' lists, and it's so many young names, and that's really exciting to do when you're trying to think of sleepers, who's the next breakout guy. But it's important to remember, not that Tyler Boyd is old, he'll be turning 28 this season, but just that these quote unquote boring veteran types can still have just as much upside in the right situation. Boyd is definitely one of those guys. Debro, who is your next pick at wide receiver? I would love to poo-poo the Boyd pick, but the real wide receiver one, Auden Tate, is not on Cincinnati, know, so he's not going to factor into the, the wide receiver target share there. So we'll, anyway, we'll keep this moving. Um, Wondell Robinson. I Look, Kenny Galladay. <laughs> I mean, like, I don't want to really like just trash on the guy, but he he looks like he's done. He looks like he's done considering what we've seen in the preseason so far and last year. Wanda Robinson has a chance to possibly lead this team in targets. If Kadarius Tony doesn't break out, he's not the player that we all think he could be. Capitalizes on his talent this year. We could see Wanda Robinson lead this team. Sterling Shepard, we still have no clue on his health when we could possibly even see him on a field. Talked about Galladay. I mean, outside of that, what are we looking at? Uh, Saquon Barkley, Daniel Bellinger, Colin Johnson. These are the fighters that he has to play, face off against weekly for targets. No, 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 no. I get that Wando Robinson is not exactly the tallest guy in the room, but he doesn't have to be. We need to get past that a little bit because his collegiate production was fantastic. He was the fifth highest graded PFF, uh, well, per PFF receiving grade last year at, at Kentucky, 10th in Yak fourth in yards per route run and he was 95th percentile or higher in collegiate target share and breakout age so outside of the fact that the man is not exactly tall he might need some elevator shoes i uh, 
why do we not like Rondo Wando Robinson considering he's been airdropped into what we think is going to be an improved offense. The offensive line is going to be better. And if Daniel Jones can't cut the mustard, Tyrod Taylor showed last year he can at least be serviceable and support fantasy wide receivers. So Wandell needs to be going higher than what he is. I love him. I, I, I just keep gobbling up the value with him in best ball right now. D Deber, I want you to keep this detour that I'm about to send you on quick, but <laughs> I've done enough shows with you to know that you love Kadarius Tony. I've done enough shows with mm -hmm. you to know that you love Wondell Robinson, and I've done enough shows with you to know that you love Saquon Barkley. So why is a guy like Daniel Jones not your sleeper quarterback? Why have you not spoken more about him if he has all these weapons that you think are going to have really good years? Uh, my best ball exposures and my my money, my skin in the game definitely um, sides with that. Um, some of the the at least for redraft purposes and things like that, some of the headlines coming out the last few days have had me to pump the brakes a little bit. Why I didn't mention Daniel Jones in here, because he has been struggling in practice. We do have a dependable veteran on this roster and the Giants are not married to him long term. So while my best ball, best ball portfolio might be hurting, I don't want to steer people the wrong direction in redraft. Ian, who's your next wide receiver? The guy who Brian Dayball is hoping Wondell Robinson will be, Isaiah McKenzie, you know, Josh Allen, the actual slot receiver yes. for Buffalo. And, you know, we don't have the Daniel Jones issue. It's not a given that McKenzie is just going to be the locked in starting slot receiver for the Bills, but it's looking that way, man. He got the rest alongside the rest of the Bills starters, and Jameson Crowder was the one out there working with the second team there in their first preseason game. So down the stretch, see, my lights in my office went out, man. This is legit. So that, uh, down the stretch, of last season like we did see neither Cole Beasley nor McKenzie play more than 51 percent of the snaps from week 17 through a divisional round like that's our worst case Crowder McKenzie rotate but you know when the guy on fantasy pros is still going 83rd uh, among wide receivers with 209 overall like you see it over at uh, underdog fantasy and best ball world where he's the wide receiver 69 152nd player off the board I know wide receivers fly off an underdog faster than anywhere but still man like seeing that 50 spot overall difference it takes a while i think for it's just mostly because i a lot of people ha haven't done their redraft uh, stuff yet but i think we're going to continue to see mckenzie fly up these boards and for good reason he's a really talented player we saw it in that patriots game and just his explosiveness over the years and the bills are trusting him like if the bills say he's there it's the same thing with gabriel davis like i understand it's like well, why didn't he do this in the previous years like okay we're playing fantasy football in 2022 and the bills are telling us that Gabriel Davis and <laughs> seemingly Isaiah McKenzie are going to be two of Josh Allen's top three wide receivers. So, you know, unless we think Josh Allen's going to bust, which it sure doesn't seem like anyone's going there. Uh, I don't see how, you know, these guys aren't going to have at least some pretty solid production, particularly in McKenzie's case at this uh, relative ADP. Cole Beasley, one of only 10 players with at least a hundred targets in each of the past three seasons that can now be Isaiah McKenzie. Are fantasy managers giving too much of the Bills, you know, uh, tertiary receivers hype to Gabriel Davis when it should at least maybe some of that percentage be going to Isaiah McKenzie? I think it's the disparity is too big right now. I mean, D D Davis at least has uh, the lead. Can Touchdowns matter, guys. This oh, this whole discussion pisses me. Like, oh, what's the difference between Gabriel Davis and Jerry Judy? Yeah, like fifteen freaking touchdowns. I don't know. How come Tim Patrick? <laughs> how come Tim Patrick didn't have a problem scoring touchdowns with those quarterbacks? So, not here to you know turn us into a Jerry Judy slander podcast. But I just think uh, everyone was more so on Crowder, but his contract. So McKenzie didn't get a big contract, but then Crowder really didn't either. So it's kind of their mm -hmm. ADPs have flip flopped. Uh, recently and yeah man again I just think McKenzie is someone that we're going to see popping up a lot you know in the in the mainstream media sleeper articles here in a few weeks because this is looking more and more likely he's going to have that starting role which for a lot of the offseason we weren't nearly as sure about D bro I said that most of our sleepers on your guys's lists are uh, young guys up and comers that is not the case for your final wide receiver no, before I get to the old man in the room here, um, I, I love the McKenzie call. And I put a tweet out this morning, uh, one of the Bills beat writers, and I will butcher his name, so I'm not going to sit here and put it in here, um, from The Athletic was talking about Isaiah McKenzie. He's been running ahead of Jamison Crowder since all, like the beginning of August, all off season. I'm with you, Ian. Like and McKenzie's in my, I think he's in my wide receiver 50 range. Hell yeah. And which is still maybe undervaluing the guy considering the role that Cole Beasley had and what we've seen in small samples. So love the call. But yeah, to get to the, uh, the old bird in the room here, uh, I still believe that Julio Jones has juice in those legs. 
wide receiver 69, 163rd overall. And yes, yes, I, I get it. Everybody's gearing up. They're they're preparing all their injury jokes, their their geriatric jokes, um, which are all old and tired as well. Uh, they're terrible. You need to stop stop mentioning them every single time I tweet about Julio Jones. But I think he really does still have something left in the tank. If we can get health to comply and he is on the field inside of this really good Tampa Bay offense. Last year, Julio Jones, 11 games played. Only six of those did he manage to have 60% or higher of the snaps. In those games, and we're, we're, we're saying, okay, he's playing a lot of snaps. Mm, he's probably healthier in these. So not just like trying to cherry pick certain games, but six, it's almost half the games he played. Actually a shade more if my mental math works right. In those six games, 2.18 yards per route run. He had a 78 PFF receiving grade. Now, to give the context to that, and it was 38 targets, so we're not talking like he got the ball thrown to him like five times, ten times, something like that. To put context to that yards per route run ranking and the PFF grade, that yards per route run would have ranked 10th, tied with T. Higgins amongst all wide receivers last year with 35 or more targets. So we were talking about 114 wide receivers, and his PFF receiving grade would have been 23rd right behind Terry McLaurin. So if Julio Jones has health on his side this year in a really good Tampa Bay Buccaneers offense, I'll take the discount. I'm not going to discount the man. We've seen numerous, and I'm not talking about some schmo that just happens to still be in the league at age 33. He's legitimately one of the best wide receivers to ever put on a pair of cleats ever in NFL history. There's a pretty good damn track record of these older wide receivers still having good seasons at that age. So don't come at me with, eh, he's over the age cliff and stuff. It can still happen, people. Ian, you said earlier on this show that we are not good at predicting injuries. So are you in on Julio Jones this year? I'm surprised he hasn't risen up more. I mean, when he was a free agent, we were kind of taking him in the late wide receiver 70s, early wide receiver 80 range and see him wide receiver 69. Like, I think that's more than viable. He's going after like Corey Davis, He's... Robbie Anderson, Joshua Palmer. Like, what are we doing here, guys? Not that there's anything wrong with them, particularly Palmer. But I just think that he landed in the best case situation. They gave him $6 million. Like, that's more than Juju got. And if we can go back to 2018 and talk about when Juju was good, why can't we do it with Julio as well? So, uh, you know. A little bit of a difference in the age. I understand it's it. He's but old, Ian. They don't, he's nobody wants old. the old bird. It's okay yeah. though. Like, but, but that's that, that's why he's as cheap. So mm -hmm. screw it. It's being baked into the cost, and he just has a. a he's someone that I think is probably if. Goblin comes back week one and like everyone's healthy the entire year. I'd probably think he finishes around this range, but something happens to any of those guys. It's going to be Julio that's getting his number called. And yeah, the idea that he was washed last season, he was hurt last season. He went out there and had some good games. He looked like a big, fast guy. Uh, I will say getting used to him wearing number 85, looking big, looking thick out there. So I don't know, man, maybe go back to the, uh, I guess he, I don't know if he can get the 11 over in Tampa these days, but uh, that, that, that is shocking. Some of these numbers, man, Sky Moore in 24, uh, Kenneth Gamewell still rocking the 14. I know Julio, uh, Julio's a true millennial, but these Gen Zers, man, I can't stand it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ian, who's, who's your last receiver? I'm going with Rondale Moore, another Gen Zer, but I think Rondale is actually going to have a chance to have that every down roll we were hoping for last season. He's going basically the exact same spot. I looked at uh, yesterday. I just looked at his ADP before week one last season. He was going in that late wide receiver 50 range. Right now, wide receiver 55, number 137 player overall. Cliff Kingsbury. Might not love the way the things he does on the field, but he's been honest with us about, you know, his player uses. Last year, he was like, we got Hopkins and AJ and Rondale kind of falls in with the other guys. And we were like, he can't be serious about AJ being ahead of Rondale, right? Well, he was. So that was unfortunate. But listening to Cliff this year, ever since they got rid of Christian Kirk, he's been saying Rondale is going to take that slot job. He is going to be our guy. We, get, we did not give him enough touches. We're going to do that this year. He said that before the Marquise Brown trade. He said that act after the Marquise Brown trade. He said it again like a week ago. Like every time they put a microphone in front of Cliff Kingsbury's face, he's talking about Rondale Moore getting more involved in the offense. So I think Rondale 
based on Kyler Murray distributing the ball, has a chance to be more of like a 1C, 1B in this option, even once DeAndre Hopkins gets back from his suspension. Like, you look at those early season numbers last year, just the target disparity in the entire offense when Hopkins was out there. And, like, there was five or six guys, like, all within 10 targets of one another. So I think Rondale is someone that, really could just be, you know, a made for PPR sh- sort of, you know, low dot slot target hog. And, you know, we keep talking about it's going to be Daryl Williams or, you know, Benjamin getting these Chase Edmonds targets. Why not Rondale Moore, someone that they have been willing to actually use as a true running back for short periods of time. So, yeah, the risk is that we just see him continue to be that gadgety guy. And when Hopkins comes back on the field, they play freaking A.J. Green and Antoine Wesley ahead of him. That is a possible outcome But again, that's the worst case scenario. And for someone going wide receiver 55, the other outcome is that he's the number two, number three pass game option for Kyler freaking Murray. I'm okay taking that chance. Debra, let's move to the tight ends now on our all sleeper teams. Who do you have here? Uh, I've got to go with, we're going to go youth. We're going to go athleticism. We're going to go upside. And I don't give a crap who his quarterback is throwing in the ball. Uh, David Njoku, a tight end 17, is still laughable. 152nd overall for a player. We saw him get the bag. They booted Austin Hooper out of Cleveland. He's going to take over the main role, and I am super excited for this. And I'll just keep gobbling up the value because we're looking at a tight end that we know the athleticism. We always talk about tight ends take a while to get their feet under them in the NFL, but yet we want to sit there and slander David Njoku when last year he was 11th in yards per outrun, he was 5th in yak per reception, and 19th in yards per team pass attempt. David Njoku could easily flirt for the team lead in targets and challenge Amari Cooper, who is a declining wide receiver, who is overrated, overranked by consensus. Uh, if I'm putting my chips to the middle on an athletic, I mean, he he literally checks every single box that we want out of a late round tight end. He has target upside, he is athletic, and he's shown us efficiency. So, I, 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 don't, I don't really understand what's not to like here for David Njoku, and honestly, he should be going higher than what he is. But until everybody catches up and the ADP catches up, I'm just going to keep drafting him. You, you said, Deaver, that you don't care about the quarterback. I mean, you care a little, right? Not really. No. I mean, like, could what he get better mean? quality targets from Deshaun Watson? Sure. Mike Gusecki wasn't bad catching balls from Jacoby Brissett last year, okay? So, I, you know, we can only push the man down so far. All right, yeah, Ian, we, we, we want Watson, though. I mean, come yeah. on. It absolutely <laughs> I mean, comparatively, <laughs> but the thing of it is, is we believe in David Njoku's talent. Can he still break out? I'll, I'll toss this back to you. Can David Njoku still break out if we got a full season of Jacoby Brissett, Ian? Could it still happen? I, I'd say breakout is like, I think he finished top 12. I don't think he's going to be like okay. Mark Andrews territory. Like we need to take him. Next oh, year, which yeah. I, if he makes us a, uh, if he's still a 2023 sleeper, um, I'm fine with that. I'm not, I'm not out on a joker. I just, you know, come on, like Watson's 10 times the quarterback. Watson, yes, been in his yes. dreams. But uh, the one thing with Njoku that was good too, he did get that 100% snap rate with the starters in the preseason. He got it also in the one game Hooper missed last year. But if you look at the two years where it's like four total games that Hooper missed, Harrison Bryant like somehow out-targeted Njoku. You don't need to go back that far in history to find the last time the Browns, you know, paid a tight end 50 million bucks to only to not use him that often. But I do agree that, you know, again, Go and pick 152. Like, this is the sort of talent profile with an everyday. Like, David Njoku might as well be like who everyone wants Albert O to be. And to see Albert O still going ahead in Njoku, like, it's pretty, pretty ridiculous to me. I'm going real deep here. This is Hayden Hurst, tight end 26, number 198 overall. This is a best ball pick. Like, hey, if you completely fade tight end in your draft, okay. But, like, you know, he's not someone that I would even recommend, you know, unless you're going, like, 25 rounds deep or something there because you should just be getting your number one tight end early. And traditional redraft leagues, you don't need to take a second one more times than not. But with Hayden Hurst, I think if we're trying to find this year's Dawson Knox or the 2022 version of 2021 Robert Tunyon, you know, we're looking for – tight ends that are more than just blockers they have some you know semblance of receiving ability and a really good offense with a really good quarterback where hey we could see them you know finding a way into the end zone eight to ten times on only 60 or 70 targets and i think Hurst, you know checks all those boxes so do guys like gerald everett i think irv smith depending on the health he's barely even a late round tight end though at this point but i just think that you know you look at Hurst like yeah it hasn't worked out as previous two uh, stops but hey if you're gonna lose your job you might as well lose it to mark 
Andrews and Kyle Pitts. I mean, he's it, talking about two pretty good guys there that managed to kind of get him out of the picture. Most of the reports throughout training camp have been saying that Hurst is going to be the guy and seeing Drew Sample suffer that knee injury, which only out for a couple of weeks, but it's just more time for Hayden Hurst to be cemented as that guy. And again, he is free right now. So I do think that uh, Hurst, he's someone that we're going to see on the cover of every like week two waiver wire article if we see that near every down rule that CJ Uzoma had last season. And I know Uzoma wasn't necessarily a guy that we were lining up to play, but you know, Joe Burrow didn't have the gaudiest counting numbers last year. If we see Burrow kind of have that same thing with Tyler Boyd. If we see Burrow like really leaned on now to lead this offense and put forward one of the more prolific passing attacks in the league, I think Hurst could actually help a lot of people there in the late round tight end scene. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was with you on Boyd, Hurst. I mean, now you're getting into can this offense carry four fantasy relevant guys. But to your point, somebody like a, a Dawson Knox esque season, you don't need to get all the targets to still be an impact guy, especially at a position like tight end, where after the first, you know, tier or two, it's pretty much, you know, you're just hoping for the touchdown. Anyways, let's move to our flex players. You guys actually both picked receivers. So really just your final and fourth receivers here for the all sleeper team. Debra, starting with you. Uh, I'm going to go with an ugly name here. Uh, again, uh, injury jokes notwithstanding. Devontae Parker, wide receiver 60, 149th overall. Dog. Look, so, somebody is going to break out from this Patriots receiving court. All these all these players are going so late. Somebody's going to emerge. And we got boots on the ground, people. Like You need to be following Andrew Erickson's Twitter timeline. He's been at Patriots camp. He keeps talking about how Parker is their number one wide receiver. And there is credence if you go look at the numbers for Parker and why they brought him in. Outside of Jacoby Myers, a lot of these other wide receivers have struggled against man coverage. You have now Myers was fifth in win rate versus man coverage last year. But Kendrick Bourne, 31st. Nelson Aguilar, 60th. Hunter Henry is a zone weapon. Now you look at Devontae Parker and how his skill set translates. Yes, he struggled last year. But in the two previous seasons before that, he was 12th in yards per route run versus a man coverage, 33rd the year before. And you marry this with Mac Jones, who last year was first in man coverage throw rate and seventh in completion rate versus man coverage. Makes a lot of sense when they brought Parker in. And if Erickson, our, our guy with boots on the ground, is saying that he's the number one, Again, it, people don't really understand and they, they don't want to wrap their head around the fact that the Patriots were still a top 12 scoring offense last year. We got concerns about Joe Judge and, and Matty Pat sitting here calling plays or at least trying to with crayons and little tiny pieces of paper, but still talented players got to bet on talent. Speaking of Erickson boots on the ground, be sure to check out the Fantasy Pros TikTok page where Andrew is posting different clips that he's getting from Patriots training camp this offseason or I should say preseason. Ian, who is your flex? Is Andrew still like dancing in those clips or are these just uh, <laughs> are these just football ones? <laughs> they, uh, they not these. <laughs> Yeah, statistically, Parker or even Jacob Jacoby Myers is the highest going Patriots receiver. But like Patriots wide receivers, like that is the cheapest position group in all of fantasy. And Mac Jones was the best rookie quarterback last year by a good margin. What if he gets better? Could see a lot of good stuff happening there. I mean, people just they shy away too much from uncertain situations instead of accepting that these players are that cheap because it's uncertain. And that's mm -hmm. actually a nice opportunity. So I'm going with Jahan Dotson. Yes, it's a quarterback upgrade from Taylor Haneke to Carson Wentz. Uh, we've been over that already. But with Dotson, I think it's one of these phenomenons where no one was out on him as a prospect. I know a lot of people liked him, but I think he went higher with the 16th overall pick than folks expected. And instead of kind of accepting like, hey, Washington must really like him, it's almost like, oh, Washington reached on him. And we, because of this, we have him going rounds after guys like Garrett Wilson and Chris Olave. I, I think Olave certainly deserves to be – to be there, but you could argue Dotson's like in a much better situation and should be probably projected for more targets than Garrett Wilson from day one. Meanwhile, you know, Wilson's going wide receiver 50, 115th overall. Dotson's wide receiver 62, 147th player overall. So Terry will be the number one in that offense, but already in the week one of the preseason, Dotson, not Curtis Samuel, was the one starting in two wide receiver sets. So I just think that we have a top 16 overall pick that's outside the top 60 freaking wide receivers like it doesn't need to be any more complicated than that than that in my opinion Jahan Dotson one of one of the wide receivers I've been happiest to scoop up and and best ball land too like don't be don't be afraid because you obviously need your second quarterback if you get like a really good one like Kyler or Josh Allen whoever in that top tier like 
when I see someone like Carson Wentz or Jared Goff, like these guys are going literally in the last round. Hey, Derek, you know, we, we like our fields. We like our Tua's and everything like that. But like sometimes in this QB2 range, you're seeing guys like Tua, like Daniel Jones being reached mm-hmm. on like in rounds 12 or 13. If we can get a starting quarterback in round 18, guys, you know, even if you don't like him, the ceiling's not the highest. I really do like uh, the opportunity cost that you're getting there. So I've had uh, some, some, some might say disgusting uh, McLaurin, Dotson, one stacks out there. But hey, man, don't hate the player, hate the ADP. And Dotson's <laughs> ADP is looking pretty good right now. I like Dotson. And the other thing about it, we need to throw in here for, and then I'll, I'll shade Carson Wentz just a little bit. Dotson's <laughs> used to sitting here and dealing with, with bad quarterback play. Just ask yeah. about Sean Clifford for all his years at Penn State. So he's used to dealing with, uh, with those big mitts of his. He's used to dealing with off target throws. But I love the Dotson call because he's, he's a Terry McLaurin injury away from seeing a 20% plus target share in this offense. So, and, and being the main guy, like who's he going to compete with? Uh, Curtis Samuel, um, Deami Brown, Logan Thomas. Okay, uh, probably not. So I, I, I like Dotson uh, for a first round wide receiver. It's going way too late. Yeah, to pull back the curtain, uh, Debro wanted to pick Isaiah McKenzie, and he couldn't because mm-hmm. he was picked already by Ian. And then he's like, okay, well, instead I'll pick Jahan Dotson, and he couldn't because <laughs> he was already picked. Ryan Ryan messaged me this morning and said, great, great wait minds. a minute, D- is Dotson on both of y'all's lists? Or y- you said you're going to change that name, and I was like, damn it, Ian, damn it. <laughs> That's All great, right. man. We're on the same page. <laughs> L- last player here, Ian, give me your all-sleeper team kicker. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Good one. I was, I was about to say. That was a good one. <laughs> Lord, no, I was like, oh, I didn't even prep for that. <laughs> no, let's uh, let's recap the rosters mm. here. Debro's oh. all sleeper team is quarterback to a tug of Iloa, running back Brian Robinson, running back two Kenneth Gainwell, wide receiver Jalen Tolbert, wide receiver two Wandale Robinson, wide receiver three Julio Jones, tight end David Njoku, and flex is Devontae Parker. For Ian, we have quarterback Justin Fields, running back Naeem Hines, running back two Jamal Williams, wide receiver Tyler Boyd, wide receiver two Isaiah McKenzie, wide receiver three Rondell Moore, tight end Hayden Hurst, and flex is Jahan Dotson. Everybody listening, head over to YouTube to leave a comment picking which team has the most sleeper potential. And while you're there, if you haven't already, go ahead and drop a like and subscribe to the Fantasy Pros YouTube channel. Guys, let's open up the mail back here to end the show. We're going to continue to hit on these as draft season rolls on. But if the listeners want even more access to our analysts, be sure to join us on Discord at fantasypros.com slash chat. A premium subscription will get listeners full access to our analysts through AMAs, stages, and more. Just one question here today. At Mr. Meerkat asks, with the first overall pick in PPR leagues, what are the better positional advantages for the 2-3 turn? A wide receiver like Debo Samuel, tight end like Mark Andrews, even a quarterback like Josh Allen. Ian, I'll start with you. What are you doing at the 2-3 turn? I'm not taking Allen. I'm fine with Andrews if the right wide receivers are gone specifically. I'm not taking Debo or a two, three turn. That's a little bit further. So if Andrews falls down there, I'm cool with that. I would take Andrews ahead of probably Debo and Evans, Higgins and Tyreek become a little bit tougher calls. I would say I've shot away from Andrews a little bit more. I'm probably just taking best available uh, running back and wide receiver there. T. Higgins, guys, continuing to fall into round three has been a blessing. So I say in an ideal world, I'm getting T. Higgins and uh, Alvin Kamara, Javante Williams type. We'll see how much further uh, Kamara keeps on rising, though. Debra, what about you? Are you also going running back wide receiver at the turn? Yeah, for me, it's running back wide receiver. If you can lock up, like, basically – I mean, CMC, the best running back in football. And then you also can double tap running back. And you, basically, you're out on the running back position for the next few rounds. So you're starting running back, running back. You get one of these other high upside running backs. And then you just start hammering wide receivers for the next three, four rounds, five rounds. It's exactly how I'm going to approach it. I love leaving the first three rounds with at least two running backs. And you know, you, yep. you, you, you can go heavy wide receivers. Let the draft come to you. You know, don't have a mm-hmm. one be all end all strategy. But just, you know, from having done a you know 50 plus of these already, just I feel better about the teams that get a couple running backs early. I'm the exact same way. Literally every best ball draft I've done this offseason, when I take two running backs in the first couple picks, I can just focus on receiver. And even then, I still feel like there's too many receivers for me to take all the ones I want. There's just such a deep position, as it has been the last few years. And in all the drafts where I don't, where I just take one running back, I am always regretting it because it just dries up so quickly let's wrap it up there fellas another awesome episode chock full of a ton of quality information 
and analysis. Please, everyone, remember all the opportunities we mentioned, including our Devonte Adams signed jersey giveaway and the Fantasy Pros cheat sheet creator. Thank you, the fans, so much for listening. For Ian and Debro, I'm Ryan Warmly. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for tuning in to the Fantasy Pros YouTube channel. Don't forget to check out our featured videos. And while you're at it, make sure to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Fantasy Pros so you can get the latest news and updates to give you the edge you need in your fantasy league.